All right. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for coming out, friends. Welcome to another uh, Curator's Codex. Um, oops. We'll let that slide. Um, go ahead and take. All right. Thank you. Go ahead and take one of these. There are handouts, just like there was last time. So that's right. Handouts. Actually, leave one with me so I uh, make sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. Up to another uh, curator's codex, uh, an event sponsored by Friday Arts Project, where we have select conversations on the arts. Uh, we invite an artist, an academic, or an advocate to address a topic of cultural influence, and then we take time at the end to discuss it. Um, yeah, this, this is now moving backwards. Anyway, so uh, thanks for joining me for the second of three talks I'm giving this fall on a defense of the arts. So my first one was last month on why art. We recorded it on uh, video, and it's up on our YouTube channel. So if you want to catch it, then you can. Uh, we're starting to put more stuff up there. I'm gonna we're going to be trying to do more artist interviews and things like that. So it would be good to get more content up there. This month, I'm going to be uh, speaking on talking and making. Why? Talking about the arts and culture and actually making art and or cultural artifacts are, valu are valuable for everyone, anyone and everyone. Next month, I'm going to be speaking on the value of art to us as human beings. How does it make us uh, better human beings? Um, it's, it's as important as talking about the arts. Also, I may not state it as explicitly, um, but I am including um, uh, patronage of the, ar of, of the arts is also a part of making. Uh, so I'm including with talking, thinking about the arts, because it's always good to think before you speak, though I've been known to do the other. Uh, but it's also, I'm including for making, if you're supporting the making of arts, that's also kind of included, even though I won't state that explicitly. Something I heard uh, years ago from a screenwriter, uh, Barbara Nicolosi, uh, Nicolosi, she said there are two types of people in this world, artists and those who support them. So though that's a very rather narrow definition, it says something very valuable. Um, also trying to confine my comments as best I can to talking uh, about and the making of art, though talking and making in other areas is certainly valuable. It's beyond the bounds of just the arts and culture. I remember a, a story my brother told me once uh, of a time when, uh, when he remembered as a young kid sitting in the back uh, back seat of the car mom was driving. He remembers uh, mom bursting out to him while driving, oh, Chris, look at the green of that grass. Uh, and almost as she was overwhelmed by the, the intensity of the green of the grass and, and uh, wanted Chris to enjoy it. I think my brother and I had been talking about our earliest memories regarding uh, even art, and he shared that moment. I recall him saying how that encouraged him. It was like the first experience of how to look at things, even as a kid to really see color even in its intensity. There's a value even in, in the earliest years of encouraging uh, young youngins how to see things. Uh, Mom was talking about art even in our youth, so um, there's value in it. I'm gonna speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, more or less, and then we'll take some time to interact about the content for about 15 minutes or so. Now in this, I hope to accomplish three things uh, tonight. Two um, harder than the last, but that is first, uh, I want to connect tonight's subject of talking and making with one aspect of last month's talk, uh, mystery. I want to make a hard connection there. Second, I want to talk about the foundational nature of talking and making art to life, ultimately because its connection is to imagination and how we interact with our imaginations. And then I want to make some practical observations. So that's at least my hope as I tackle uh, these three things. Um, if I don't, please alert me. Um, so let me talk about this first thing, uh, making the connection to mystery, this hard connection. Last month, uh, I talked about kind of a geography of beauty. 
like where is it located. I wasn't relying too much on the various definitions, though I think uh, about beauty, but that I, though I thought they were good, uh, I talked more about the location of beauty, which one of those characteristics, um, uh, and one of the characteristics of it that is right there is needed is beauty and its instigator and it shapes it, which is mystery. So I, I used Friday Arts Project vision statement, which you have in your handout as an inspiration. That's why I put it on there. Uh, in the first part, it says beauty exists where truth and goodness meet mystery. That's the geography of beauty. And mystery is a huge importance to that. When somebody approaches the mysterious in a truthful and goodly manner, that place has the most potential to produce something beautiful. And I defined the mysterious very basically, uh, basically as the unknown. And I put a little asterisk, more. It's the unknown, but more than that. But that's a good basic uh, definition. Now, I realized uh, the past few weeks that the act of talking about and making art is heavily dependent on how we see that mystery. So how you define it, how you see it, how you begin to define it, really does have an impact on how and what to you're talking about with regards to the arts and beauty and, and also but how you make it, how you proceed in the making of it. So let me try to explain that. If you think that m the mysterious is um, large, if you think it's immense in size, uh, perhaps even limitless, so s suppose you kind of get a sense that the mystery is, is big, it's, it's limitless, that will enlarge the potential of your talk about it. It will enlarge your potential of being able to tackle things to make in response to it. If you think the mysterious is limited, still unknown but limited, uh, that it can be known completely, just a matter of time, then that will limit your talking. Uh, that will limit uh, how you make or what you think about making in regards to that mysterious realm of the unknown. It might even become, it could even become dangerous if you, because um, it could take you down, you could probably do that with the other, but it, it could really make it more dangerous in any way. You're talking about the art and making about art will be impacted by how much mystery you believe exists. It will be impacted by the nature of mystery. I've come to the conclusion that this mystery we talk about in our vision and even in the arts, you, we, uh, we talk about the muse. You know, that's one of the classic ways you talk about, well, what, what are you seeing? What are you imagining? I've come to the conclusion that this mystery we talk about in our vision statement, I believe it, it's important to the generation of beautiful things. It has to have at least two characteristics to be truly motivating. Uh, this is, regardless of um, some of the extra details of what you believe or characteristics of the mysterious, I think these two have to be fundamental in order for it to be the most motivational. And one, it has to be transcendent. It has to be transcendent. It has to be big. And the second, it has to be personal. It has to be both those. It has to be huge, but it's also got to be here. Why? Why transcendence? Well, think about it. If you don't believe the mysterious is transcendent, and I would even use the word ultimate, limitless, then it would have limits could be known fully. It's just a matter of ta time to track it all down, right? If we could really track everything that's unknown, and uh, we'd, we would have a limited thing that we, there'd, be, there'd be a time where we could finish talking about it. Uh, you've probably heard of the, um, the example of, do you believe in a world that's all inside the box or outside the box? You've heard that kind of phraseology. If you believe um, how you answer that question, it, it, do you believe everything can be known is inside the box, there's nothing outside the box? Or do you believe that there is stuff outside the box that's just as real and can be known? 
that what we see here, touch, feel, t um, uh, and taste is inside the box. But do we also do you also believe there's something real outside that that you can't touch? Depending on how you answer that and associate that with mystery, would affect the level and degree of talking and making of the art. Now, don't get me wrong, if you think everything mysterious is completely knowable inside the box, then what can be known is as wide as the universe and as deep as DNA. And that's, that's big. I mean, have you ever, I know they've released some of these in books, and I think you can find it on the, I'm sure you can find it on the internet, about how they, they start talking about how immense the, the known universe is. It's so immense, it just makes you, floor. That, that's still very big. But that's still the that's just a very 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 big box. Um, but then going inside human the human body, just the discovery of DNA. You could go. They've even discovered things beyond that. That uh, that's pretty wide and deep. But it's still limited to we could know it all if you believe it's only inside the box. However, if you believe that there is even more stuff in that mystery, in the mysterious, that is real and true as much as the stuff inside the box, then there are no heights to, uh, of limit to what could be known or what we could know, either in the wide universe or the depths of the human body and soul. So you, I don't know if you can see, the, the way uh, the weight shifts about talking about the arts and culture and making art by what you believe in that mystery. If you believe it's much bigger than what the known universe is, that really gives some gravity, more gravity how you talk about and what you talk about. Um, so I think that mystery has to be transcendent because it has to be able to carry the weight of even the nature of what is beautiful. Um, but it also has to be personal. As much as the nature of that mystery has to be immensely large, even limitless, dare I say infinite, it also needs to be real. Real in the here and now. It has to, have, has to be something graspable by our meager human hands and minds, and we have to be able to see it, hear it, and taste it. Now why? Why do we? Because if the mystery is only transcendent, then it is hard to apply. It's hard to know in the here and now. Gregory Wolf, uh, the former uh, editor of Image Journal once wrote that, and we referenced this last time, is that beauty without truth is a lie. He also wrote that beauty without goodness is fleshless abstraction. And that's basically what happens if there was no personal to, there's no personalness to the mystery. It would become a lie. It would just almost become a mask or even fleshless abstraction. We wouldn't be able to understand it. There'd be no way to take the ideas and the thoughts and the things we're having about what is unknown and try and make it something that communicates to the people here and now. Um, and as I mentioned last week, uh, Elaine Scarry talks about in her book how beauty can only be seen in the particulars. I think she's right. If we can't find it in the particulars, then it makes no sense trying to pursue it. Uh, if it only can be found in the ideas of the transcendent, then, and it can't be applied locally, then it really isn't worth the effort for doing that. So, in my mind, this makes it necessary for the mysterious to be not just transcendent, but also particular, also personal. Now, let me, I want to read a, um, I want to read a poem here, a section of a poem from, um, uh, Wendell Berry, one of his Sabbath poems, and it, it kind of gives that, I think it does a nice play between the transcendent and the personal, the particular. Uh, and this is from, let me see if I can, this is from 2006. Uh, most of his Sabbath poems were not titled, but these were, this is in a series called The Book of Camp Branch. This is the last section, and this is what he said. It says, the song changes by singing into a different song. It sings by falling. The water descending in its old groove wears it new. The words descending to the page render the possible into the actual by wear. For better or worse, renew the wearied mind. 
This is only the lonely stream of Camp Branch, but every stream is lowly. Only low in the land does the water flow. It goes to seek the level that is lowest, the silence that gathers many songs, the darkness made of many lights, and then by the sun is raised again into the air. I really like the way he's talking about these ideas, and he's associating them with singing. He's associating them with water, and how they need to find the lowest point to really, to really sing, have to find the really lowest point in order to rise. And he talks about that in the context of water running off a, a bank, streams near this place called Camp Branch. But then he talks about how the sun rise, raises them up. And well, what, what do we know about water when the sun hits it? It evaporates, right? Water becomes something else, and it, it rises. So I, I love that. I found this recently. I love this interplay between the transcendent and then also the practical where he's inviting us to think more deeply about uh, the ideas of the world, but then he's also trying to make it practical so that we can see it, so we can grasp it, those who are not as good. Sometimes I'm not as good about that stuff, but anyway. Can you see that what you think and believe about the mysterious can affect the degree to which you v the value is given to talking and making of art, talking about and making of art? Well, of anything, quite frankly, uh, but tonight we're talking about art. Uh, this is why I bring my, uh, my Judeo-Christian worldview into the arts with me. The transcendent and the personal nature of the mysterious I find easily in the nature of the God of the Jewish and Hebrew, uh, Jewish and Christian scriptures. Now, you may not believe that, and that is fine, but I think anyone who believes wouldn't believe, as I do as a Christian or Judeo-Christianity, still has to find the transcendent and personal in the nature of the mysterious. I think you're not, you're not going to find moments of being able to, to make beautiful things or make impactful things, or even your talk about it might, might wander. And I, need, I think it needs to carry both those characteristics, regardless of what you believe about the transcendent. It needs to be ultimate. It needs to be transcendent. Um, beauty, art, and goodness need something big enough to carry those values. It also needs to be personal. It needs to be able to be smelled and tasted and seen and challenging in radiant colors, forms, and content. Now, look at the onion diagram on your handout there. Um, this is kind of a cool way. If you think about some of the way what I was talking about there, um, you have the actualizing area. You have in, in the first um, diagram, you have two sets of things, of levels. One is the actualizing level. So this is actually what is seen, right? And that's on the outer shell, which would make sense. On the outside, we see artifacts, we see behavior. So that's the actualizing, the existential, you could even say the existential level. But then you also have the evaluating level. And this is kind of the unseen. We don't always see this on the inside of individuals or, or whatnot. And you see feelings, values, and ultimately, the foundational level of the evaluating is worldview and ultimate allegiance. And so you can see where talking and making can really bounce all around inside these layers, can it? Making, of course, ultimately expresses itself through artifacts and behavior, right? The artist actually makes something. In fact, the series my wife is working on right now is called Artifacts. So, but that which the artist is putting, whether it's a poem, whether it's a short story, whether it's dance, whether it's uh, oil on canvas, they are wrestling with the evaluating and even the foundational levels in order to find what the changes in their behavior or what it's going to be expressed in their behavior and in their artifacts. And you can see where the mystery resides firmly, I believe, right there in the ultimate allegiance and worldview. What do you believe about the nature of mystery? By talking with each other, we can assist each other in discovering and exercising truth, especially in art. Art isn't only about the artist. I think in the late modern period of, of the art, it became too much about that. 
about the internal life of the artist, but it also isn't only about the viewer, which is what has happened in the last two or more decades, it'd be much probably longer than that, of the art world with the influence of postmodern thinking. It's become too much about the viewer's influence, the viewer's power, the viewer's decision on what that, pe that piece means. Both extremes are inadequate to the exercise of discovering beauty through art. So what talking about the arts assists us in clarifying the evaluating levels and even the foundational levels may, and making forms in these zones and must be made visible um, in the behavior and in the artifacts. And of course, if you go to the next diagram, you can see where the questions that it, when you're talking about worldview, you are basically asking and concluding what is real. Beliefs is what is true, values is what is good, feelings are what is enjoyable, and then behavior is what is done, and artifacts is what is collected, or even made, you could say, artists. So I, th I thought the onion diagram fit very nicely in this area of why is it important to talk and make? Well, m making is going to happen, but what are you basing that on? Um, how are you, and I've heard others that are starting to ask that same question these days, even in the art world. Um, now let me go to the second point where I want to talk about talking and making and the imagination. Um, in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. Imagination, producing new metaphors or revivifying old, is not the cause of truth, but its condition. I love that quote. I think Lewis is on to something here. Uh, this professor of literature and author of significant 20th century books is positioning imagination, which I think is essential to art. I mean, again, I mentioned earlier, we talk about the muse. What are you, what are you thinking about? What are you musing about? And uh, I can't, uh, the number of conversations I've had with what influences an artist's expression in a piece is really fascinating. Um, it's in a foundational place. And remember, he, uh, Lewis is right. It's the condition uh, and not the cause. So uh, another literary professor, Holly Ordway, has gone so far as to say that the imagination is the foundation of reason. Uh, she says that the sequence of seeing something become reality is that you imagine it in your mind and then you work to accomplish what you've imagined. So you kind of think about stuff and you're like, man, I wonder if we could do this. We could, I want to do this. So you're kind of imagining it and you're putting it together and then you're seeking to build that. So uh, is that not the case in any creative endeavors, especially with the arts? You see or have an idea, you see almost like a vision of what you want and then you go and you try to make it. Sometimes you might see it and not like it, so you were not going to make that, that imagination. Or you might try it and you go, no, I didn't really succeed there, so I'll try something else. Can you imagine how this, wor this would work if those sequences were reversed? You started making something and then imagining it. I don't even know if that's possible. I've wondered sometimes if a goodly amount of our art in the last century has done it that way. They've just made it and not really thought about it. So you can see how easily this would fit into the layers of the onion diagram, right? Perhaps you can see also the significance to my first point even more. The nature of the mystery you pursue or we pursue together is imbued with more meaning, meaning according to its nature. You have to ask, is the imagination sourced in the box, inside that box, or is it sourced outside that box? Is it only something that we conjured up? It's like something in our heads, like literally like a little person or a little otherworldly beast that's in your mind, and it, it's the one that stirs your imagination, and then you go forth and make things. All right. You have in your hands, uh, this, is some, this is another section I came across years ago, and I've always come back to it, and I've always thought about it. Carly, you can come down and sit here if you want, next to Chris, easy chair, if you want. Um, this is a moment between, uh, from Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 5, Scene 1, and Theseus and Hippolyta, his queen Hippolyta, are, are talking. 
and um, there's some activity with these, lo- uh, these couples that are in love, and Apollida asks Theseus this question about, isn't this interesting, kind of? And this is Theseus' response. When he says, more strange than true, I never may believe these antique fable, antic fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that I apprehend more than cool reason every comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold, that is the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in the brow of Egypt. The poet's eye and fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And then he throws this great line, such tricks have strong imagination. I won't read the rest. You can read that on your own. But um, that highlighted, that bold part is really the, the crux of this. Uh, Theseus sees a lunatic, a lover, and a poet as the same. <laughs> they express themselves de- differently. The, the madman sees devils, more devils than hell can produce. The lover sees everything, you know, beautiful. And the poet's eye, this is interesting, in fine frenzy doth glance from heaven to earth, heaven to earth, and earth to heaven. And then in the imagination, bodies forth things unknown and gives them shapes, gives airy nothing. So it gives something that you don't even see, local habitation and a name. Um, I think that's a strong way of putting this mystery thing in a a good place. Do you believe that mystery is something that an artist or a creative endeavor, you're picking basically values out of the air and you're giving it local an expression, you're giving it a name? Um, That's powerful. Um, I wonder if the artists in the room feel that way. Do you, do you think that way? That the very act of putting something onto canvas or paper, whether writing or drawing, you're giving airy nothing a local habitation and a name. It's, um, I agree with Theseus. It's strong imagination. He still thinks it's fake, but... Um, I'm not agreeing with that. But. So how does art help that? How does talking and art help us with these things? Well, Karen Swallow Pryor wrote in her book, The Evangelical Imagination, that uh, we are symbol-starved people. We need, enchanted, uh, we need enchanted worlds to help us see the enchantment in our own. So... I think she could be right there. We we have a lot of we have a lot of images. We have a lot of Im- images. We're very addicted to imagery in these days. But symbols, we're kind of starved for good and solid symbols, and that's why she says we need an enchanted world to help us with the enchantment. See the enchantment in our own. In the mid-2000s, while I was working in New York City, we did an art summer project where we designed a way to cultivate conversations with people we would meet. And we found that utilizing pictures was a much more engaging and comfortable way to do this. So for the entire summer, I think this was 06, 2006, we took a bunch of photos. We had students take photos and others take photos. And we tacked them all up on a wall and had people vote on which images we should use to, to help make a packet that would, uh, of images that would cultivate significant conversations. And out of probably several hundred images, we landed on 50, had it designed and packaged well, and we called it Solarium, S-O-U-L-A-R-I-U. You guys know what a solarium is? It's like it lets all the light in. What was great about that tool was that answering questions of any depth could, could occur, but especially the heavy ones, like what picture represents what you believe about the spiritual in your life? Now imagine that. You're given a set of pictures and you ask, pick one that represents the spiritual dimension of your life right now. Your spiritual, I mean. You know. uh, or pick a picture that you think represents God most to you. And they would pick one. 
And it made it very disarming and easier to have uh, good conversations about significant things because uh, the right answer was always the answer to the question. It was the image. Talking about life using an image is powerful in respect. There's no wrong answer in an image, right, in the sense of, tell me why that is that way. So you're, you're able to get into the deeper conversations. You see a similar parallel in the rise of the, uh, of the arts used in assisting with counseling. Over the last couple decades, I've seen more and more and heard more and more of this. This is an actual section of counseling and psychological, even psychiatric uh, areas where they actually use art to help people deal with issues they may have in their life. Um, and that, I think that's kind of cool. They're, it helps pinpoint and help using images. Now imagine how your cognitive life would be if on a consistent basis you were talking about art and culture and things and even trying your hand at it, no matter how skilled or unskilled you were. Imagine how that would help you perhaps think about and see the world and maybe even approach the world. Uh, this is why I think it's important for the average citizen in our fair little city here to be involved in small and large ways in, in the making of art and the talking about art. Um, when you, as maybe similar to Theseus, say in a Midsummer's Night Dream, give to Airy nothing, a local habitation, and a name, you put that idea in place for it to be seen, and it gets, it gets grit. It, it, it gets some response. When you take and give to Airy nothing, a local habitation, you have to then engage with it. You have to see if it has merit and stands up for the... Uh, for the good of all your neighbors, and perhaps propels them onto even more beautiful things as they too plumb the depths of mystery along the way, along with us. So I want to close with this quote from Wendell Berry uh, from his bo book, Our Only World, and I think it, uh, I think it preaches. Uh, this is, um, I don't have it, I have it in my study in this book stack there. Uh, he wrote this in Our Only World. I think it has a, a, a something to say for closing here. A proper attention to our language informs us that the Greek root of anatomy, the word anatomy, means dissection. And that of analysis means to undo. The two words have essentially the same meaning. Neither suggests a respect for, legal, for formal integrity. I suppose the nearest antonym to both is a word we borrow directly from the Greek, poiesis, making, or creation, which suggests that the work of the poet, the composer, or maker is the necessary opposite to that of the analyst or the anatomist. Some scientists, I think, are in this sense poets. So, I think it's a good word, and uh, thanks for... Uh, hanging in there, and I think we will now have uh, some questions.